in my uh, career in law, I, I initially came to Namibia as a pastor, and then after a while, after seven years, I became uh, involved back in my original profession of, of, of lawyer as a prosecutor in the High Court and later on a professor at the university. But there were two people always here in Namibia who always let me feel like I'm their little brother, you know, although I'm older than both of them. The one is Judge Maritz. He's younger than I am, but uh, he was the, um, my first opponent uh, in a big case when I was still in the magistrate's court the first three months when I started prosecuting again. And, um, you, you know, he made such a fool of me at that case that afterwards I always thought of him as my big brother. And then when I went to the high court, the first case that I had in the high court, he was the judge again there. So, so um, it took me quite a while. Only when we started working together on the Namibian Law Journal, I started to feel more or less comfortable with him, but I always felt that he was the, uh, and he was the angry big brother, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and, um, the other one is uh, Professor Joe Disho, not because he was so angry, but he knew so much. Uh, we, we knew each other for quite a while, and then we, we started becoming friends a few years ago when um, Conrad Adenauer had these weekend uh, meetings or weekend getting together of the whole legal fraternity, and we will meet with judges and prosecutors and lawyers and, and academics, everybody there for a weekend at Midgard. And, and that was great. But, but the greatest part of that meeting was when everything was over and done after our evening meal, we would sit around the fire and Professor Disho would educate us on everything. And, and I mean, I mean everything. There's nothing that he doesn't know, you know. And I, I, I learned so much from him. And, and, uh, Afterwards, I've listened to him many times, and I will tell you something. I, I often think by myself, I can't imagine how one person can speak so many times and never repeat himself. I've heard him many times, many lectures giving, many papers read, and I've never heard him telling the same story twice. Um, I hope you're not going to do it tonight. Uh, don't disappoint me. <laughs> uh, but he is a great person, a great speaker. Let me just correct the, the book. Um, I send his uh, up, updated CV through, it. I don't know where it got lost, but he's no longer at the University of South Africa. He was given back to Namibia f since the beginning of last year. He's now the, the uh, what do you call yourself, the director of NIPAD, NIPAD the um, Namibian Institute for um, Public Administration. Administration and Management. Thank you. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here tonight. I'm sure that um, it's going to be exceptional. You'll all remember it for the rest of your life. Joe, <laughs> take the seat. The stand, I mean. It is not routine for people who work in the knowledge factories, such as myself, to address religionists, such as yourself. It's also lawyers. And lawyers. Yes. That's a very difficult lot. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Namibia, just to punctuate and amplify that which has been articulated by my very esteemed colleagues here from the different perspectives of the religious faith in our traditional Christian renditions. And thank you very much for helping us understand where Namibia is at right now. Uh, I would be remiss not to start by reminding you, by way of welcoming you to Namibia, that today Namibia is the most peaceful, the most stable country on the African continent, due to the faith base of the people. It was not incongruent, as it were, for the framers, drafters, and crafters of our Constitution to understand that the people here are fundamentally African and therefore religious in nature. Namibia is one of the most Christian countries in the world today. We make no apology about that. As a matter of fact, we are very happy to be 
designated as a religious country. In the Roman Catholic Church today, the gospel that was read around the world was from the book of John, zeroing in on the dictum that they may be one, just as we are one. I suspect, and I was told by my brother Nico, that we are, we are going to have a conversation about pluralism and inclusivity. Do they go together or not? It would be therefore important for us to regroup and position ourselves anthropologically, historically, sociologically, and materially in today's world. 2015, the world is not at peace. The world is not quite as at war as it was during the two European tribal wars that we are told were World War I and World War II. They were European tribal wars. They had nothing to do with us yet. <laughs> Perhaps for us to understand the warfare that is engulfing the planet Earth today, one has to be somewhat scholarly. Just after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, remember the Berlin Wall came tumbling down to all intents and purposes exactly the same time the Namibian constitution was being drafted and crafted right here in Ventric, November 1989. After the monumental experience, the world over, scholars began to theorize what the world was becoming after the collapse of the Cold War, that realism that determined the way we think about ourselves even today. You will recall that many of the conflicts on the African continent were consequences of that adventurism. African countries such as Angola, Mozambique, in our part of the world, were bedeviled by war because they either had to choose West or East. At the end of that, some people were saying, what are we now? So, a political scientist by the name of Francis Fukuyama wrote in 1992 an essay, which is a very crucial starting point of a debate. The essay was entitled, The End of History. History has ended. The last man has come and gone. After that, his professor, Samuel Huntington, tried to re respond to Fukuyama and wrote an essay, The Clash of Civilizations. And that essay is still reverberating in the political science quarters. Fukuyama said, the idioms that determined who we were have ended. Huntington said, it cannot be the world that we knew with the two polar power, the Americans on one side and the Russians on the other. So what was the world becoming now? And he suggested that the new clash in the world would be between Islam and other civilizations. Uh, it is not easy to find prophets today. But Huntington qualifies to be somewhat of a prophet. Whether we like it or not, the clash is vivid today. Last night on BBC they showed episodes of the radicalization of young people in England. Some of them as young as 15, leaving their homes to join the Islamic State in defense of something valuable. We cannot understand it if we come from the Christian tradition. We cannot understand what happens to a child. No, worse, what happens to a parent who ties 12 hand grenades on the body of a 12-year-old daughter 
and say, now you can drive into the police station. We know you cannot drive, but kill yourself. And when you get up there, remember us. We cannot understand it. Christians don't know that. That, start, that style of fundamentalism is very foreign to us. I suspect that our fundamentalism in the Christian tradition ended with missionary work. <laughs> Those men who came from Europe, by the way, they were coming to what they called no man's land. There were people living here, but they were designated as no man's land such that those who came and were shown where to find bananas, where to find things, wrote, we just discovered bananas. <laughs> <laughs> David Livingston was one of them. He was taken to Victoria Falls by the indigenous people there. Yet the record says, David Livingston discovered Victoria Falls. The place that he was taken to by those who knew it. You see, they say in West Africa, therefore, until lions have their own historians, all stories about hunting will glorify the hunter. By that I mean, my brothers and sisters, the Christian tradition, before you begin to unravel where you can work together, the Christian faith has to decide what it is in the first place. Islam is clear. If you go to the, the, the original definitions of Islam in the Holy Quran, it is surrender, <laughs> to give up, to submit. The Christians are confused. Hence, we are looking for unity. Like my brothers have indicated, one of the difficulties the Namibian state has now is how to manage the mushrooming, the multiplicity of the Christian churches, some of which we have never heard about before. And they prey on poverty-stricken communities where the pastors say on Sundays, you must tithe for God. As a matter of fact, they go as far as saying, don't put coins in God doesn't like noise. <laughs> <laughs> Only notes. But to answer the question, do we run the risk of conflict? Of course, yes, we do. It would be very, very foolhardy for any country in Africa today to say we don't have potential for conflict. We do. We do. Not only on the political front, that is how the people will deal with the widening gap between those who have on the one hand and those who do not have. Human nature tells me that when people suffer and they don't have the basic necessities in their life, they will regroup, organize, and make a plan. There are myriads of books about why people rebel when they suffer relative to those who have. And I must confess that it's very unfortunate that Namibia is one of the countries in the world with the biggest gap between the haves and the have-nots. And if we don't manage that carefully, and we are asking for the religious communities to help us understand that, because that is a moral imperative that derives from all the religions, including the Holy Quran and the Bible, for our purposes here. We can't have peace in a country where only a few have everything, and the others must watch them eat as they eat on behalf of the poor and the vulnerable. <laughs> we cannot have peace and stability where there is so much ostentation for material acquisitions. And we in Namibia are in the terrain right now. So our peace is relative not only to how we manage our resources here, ladies and gentlemen, 
but it's relative to how the Southern African community, how the African continent manage conflict. We are an African country. Our problems are African in character, and therefore the solutions that we seek must be African in character and content. That means we have a lot to do. And we have happened to be a country at peace with ourselves because we got it right to say Namibia belongs to all who live in it. And mind you, before independence, it must be known, uh, when revolution was the word to go by, the leading organization that was fighting for independence for Namibia declared itself Marxist-Leninist, the Southwest Africa People's Organization. The current governing party was Marxist-Leninist until Marxism-Leninism was discredited in 1990. So we cannot claim credit for everything we do. The Germans have a word, Zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. In other words, there are certain things in our lives that are not due to our own planning, our own control, our own power. The best case to explain Zeitgeist is this. And, and this is very clear to all who read the, the story of transition in Southern Africa, Nelson Mandela. Scholarships will show one day that Mr. Mandela's success as a leader in Africa was due to, a, thanks to apartheid. Sounds like a contradiction. Nelson Mandela's success as a leader, a moral leader, was thanks to apartheid. Therefore, thanks to the refusal of P.W. Boacher to release him. Let me make it more problematic. If it was not for the stubbornness of P.W. Bwata, who refused to release Nelson Mandela before the 11th of February 1990, Mr. Mandela would have come out of prison when the war of the world was still divided between the communists and the capitalists. Everything in front of me tells me that Mr. Mandela would have gone to the Soviet Union. That is where all African leaders were going. That's where all the struggling people were going. In fact, in his book, Long Walk to Freedom, he says, I was attracted to communism. It resembles the African spirit better than capitalism. So it is clear that he would have joined Robert Mugabe and everybody else, such that when communism was discredited, Mandela would have been discredited with it. So, South Africa or Africa or the world would not have had an innocent, potent leader to unite the world as did Nelson Mandela because he had no excuses to make about communism. He could make mistakes in the new world. He could be himself. My friends, this is very important. Angola's war would not have been what it was for more than 24 years had it not been for the turf, the scramble for fear, for sphere of influence between the United States and Russia. There is a book that was written by the head of the CIA in Angola by the name of John Stockwell. Go and look for the book, John Stockwell. And he says in that book, the Angolans did not want the war in Angola. It was the Americans who introduced the war because peace was not in the interest of the United States. Why am I saying that? I want to ask the question, where were the churches during all these years? Once we deal with that, we can ask the question more perfectly, where are the churches now? I'm honest enough to deal with the church community through you as leaders. All my upbringing tells me that in Namibia, without the church, this country would not be where it is today. Yes, we quarrel about the abuse 
of the missionaries who came and they treated others as non-persons. We know that. We understand the self-righteousness of the missionaries. We understand that. We acknowledge that. But without the missionaries, some of us would not be here today. Because the spirit is that of God. God created all of us in his own image and therefore we are entitled to privileges. We have obligations to one another. We are one another's keepers. The church this morning said we are one as they were one before. Now we are in search of unity. In Namibia we have the fragmentation of the churches. Uh, the Lutheran church is broken up into three segments. The Lutheran church, the Lutheran church, and the Lutheran church. <laughs> hmm? Two Lutheran churches. In South Africa, the Dutch Reformed Church, three. One for whites, one for colors, and the other for the rest. Same church. The Anglican Church, the same. I suspect this explains the exponential growth of charismatic Pentecostal churches in black communities in Southern Africa. Because they don't have the missionary guilt. They don't have the missionary apologeticness. They speak to the conditions of the world today and they galvanize the young people to stand for themselves. We can quarrel with that, but they are on the march, Pentecostal churches. These are churches that go on for five hours a day and people are still sitting down. You try that in the Catholic Church. After one hour and 15 minutes, people are going home. In other words, if we are to speak about the role of the church today, be it Roman Catholic, Protestant, in different formations, the question is, is there a role for the church in Africa today? By extension, in the world. Is there a role? for the church, the Christian church in the world today. One of the challenges the church faces is its own relationship with the state. And the Bible is very clear. You cannot be at the head table with Caesar and still be the person with a prophetic voice to Caesar. You see, the state in Africa, and I want to be very, very clear about this, ladies and gentlemen, the state in Africa post-independent is very smart and very clever to co-opt the church and to shut up the church. Because the church has a moral voice, an ethical voice, and in the absence of the church being at the head table, it will retain its clear, critical voice, and the state does not like that. We know that. So the church appoints bishops as ministers. You may say what you want to say, but the Bible is rather clear. It is a contradiction. It's a conflict of interest, according to consultant speak. It's a conflict of interest. The state has a particular function. The state is political. The state is about managing politics. And politics is nothing else, my friends, but who gets what, where, how, when. It's not about loving people. We can camouflage that by having intermittent elections every four or five years. But the state, it, it is, it, as it has been historically, is not what we want it to be. And the church has to decide what its relationship is in relation to the state. In 1992, a British scholar on African affairs, Basil Davidson, wrote a book with the title The Black Man's Burden. The Black Man's Burden, wherein he argues that the biggest curse on the African people today is the state 
get state which was created by Europe with which to subjugate, oppress, marginalize, stigmatize the African people as cheap laborers to service the European developmental economy. African people inherit this state in total. In fact, they never tried to adjust it to the circumstances of the, of the majority of the people. The, those who inherit the state become the new white people. <laughs> they behave exactly the same as those that they have replaced. Chino Achebe is correct in his book, The Men of the People, published in 1958. He says, the trouble with our new nation is that we've all been in the rains together. When the rain ended, we all scrambled to get into the house that our colonial masters left behind. And those who got inside, the lucky ones, but ever, ever, hardly ever the best, they got in fast and they barricaded themselves with windows. <laughs> and they speak from within that all disagreements should now stop and the whole people must speak with one voice. Chino Achebe, 1958. Chino Achebe goes back to the theme in 1984 and he writes the trouble of Nigeria, the trouble of Nigeria is leadership. The church has to speak its voice in relation to the leadership in Africa today. Burundi is in a mess. Burundi is a very Catholic church. Where is the church? When, when, when Rwanda burned in 1994, my friends, the church was involved in there. Roman Catholic priests participated in the genocide. Where was the religious community to speak about this? Where is the religious community right now to speak about corruption in Africa? The state has co-opted the bishops to pray at all the functions to bury all the dead ministers and to be given accolades. The point I'm trying to make, my friends, is we are human beings and left on our own, we can degenerate into very deplorable conditions. Therefore, the church has to be there to remind us to keep us on the straight and narrow. All philosophers of the social contract that brought about the understanding of representative government today John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Thomas Hobbes said it's a social contract. Now, in that is a recognition that we are all sinful. Thomas Hobbes says we are human beings on our own. We are beasts. Bellum omnium contra omnes. We are all waging war against the other to be better than the other. Therefore, the church is relevant to remind us that we are all created in the image of God and we all deserve dignity, we all deserve honor, we all deserve respect and we all deserve a place to be and become. The church cannot do that without the unity, without working together. It's not a Protestant solution because it has never been a Protestant problem. It's not a Catholic solution. It has never been a Catholic problem. It's a human problem. You see, why we need religion, and my brother, Shikongo, can dwell on this much more eloquently, because the Islamic faith right now is the fastest spreading religion in black townships in Southern Africa. Are you surprised? Why? Because in the thickness of constitutional democracy which allows anything, everybody, anybody, anywhere. Young people need order. Young people need direction. And when you join a mosque, you are given a definition of life. You are a human being first, created in the image of God, and therefore you are here to serve other people, not to get rich overnight, not to have the highest number of wives in the neighborhood, not to steal most capably, but to be a servant. Lastly, 
I hope that you will have conversations that are very clear and open and candid. We always blame other people, including the government, including the donors. You see, in the book by William Shakespeare, or Shaka Kaspier, depending on where you went to school, in the book Julius Caesar, there is a conversation between Brutus and Cassius. These two men are on their way to murder Julius Caesar. The record illustrates that Brutus was the fat one, the bigger one, the lazier one. Cassius was the thin, tall and clever and scheming one. So they regroup on the side of the street and Cassius says to Brutus, Brutus, dear Brutus, the fault it's not in our stars. The fault is with ourselves that we're underlings. So dear church leaders, the fault is not with politics. The fault is with the church. Where is the church today? You cannot talk unity if you do not know the purpose for which you exist. And that is why we in Southern Africa have been banging our heads trying to work out what reconciliation is. Because we started at the wrong end of things. What we should have done here in Namibia and by extension in South Africa is not to discuss reconciliation but to discuss conciliation. How to build a nation, the novel. In other words, you cannot reconcile a man and a woman if they were not husband and wife before. <laughs> you cannot reconcile two things that were not together before. In Namibia, we should have said we are conciliating a nation. We are building a nation. And I'm very grateful and humbled, my friends, to see the strides the Namibian government has made to build a nation. Uh, before you leave, Vantok, please hear our words. We are not talking about the rainbow nation in Namibia. We talk inclusivity. We talk everybody is in this house. As a matter of fact, we've gone as far as saying we are not rainbow. It's a falsehood for Africans to talk about a rainbow nation that includes South Africa. In fact, South Africans have lied to themselves sufficiently to say Bishop Tutu coined the word rainbow nation. The phrase rainbow nation comes from Chicago. Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson coined it in 1974 with Operation Push or Operation Breadbasket. But for our purposes here in Africa, the rainbow metaphor is not applicable because the, color, the colors black and white are not in the rainbow. <laughs> we are not represented in the rainbow. We in Namibia are stating boldly. Before I say that, you must know that Namibia has the best race relations on the African continent today, between blacks and whites. Because we've come so far to understand that our solution cannot be white, cannot black, but both. That's why we use the beautiful metaphor for ourselves as a zebra nation. Now you have to decide that beautiful beast, that beautiful cow in the wild called zebra, it never changes color. Now you have to decide, is a zebra a white animal with white, with black stripes, or a black animal with white stripes? <laughs> we have settled that in Namibia. It's neither but both. We are not your typical black country. For our brothers and sisters from the African continent, please hear us. We are not a typical black country. We are not a typical white country either. There are certain things we have accepted in Namibia that can be done better by white people because they are Africans. And there are certain things that we believe black people, by virtue of, your, of their culture and orientation and wiring, if you like, can do better. 
And we want to bring these two worlds in a very constructive dialogue with one another. Let the white people bring their skills and their strength. And let the black people bring what they have. And together, we'll build this house, this cathedral, where everybody feels accommodated and welcome. And that is why, in the political sense, our inclusivity is very, very deep. The first country in Africa to adopt this official language, a language that was not there before. The second one to follow the example is Rwanda. English is our, is our only official language. And you see, as you can hear, we are, we are struggling to speak this language. But our leaders decided we had more than 15 languages, including Afrikaans, the language that was used for purposes of administration. The leadership closed themselves in the, in the house and they say, let's go for a language that will not put anybody at an advantage. So we go for English. The reasoning is, everybody will suffer, <laughs> but everybody will gain. <laughs> Inclusivity is not about gaining all the time. It's about giving up so that the other can gain, and the other gains so that I can give up. Church leaders, you are needed. Governments come and go. The church stands. Political parties win and lose. The church never loses. And you want to understand the role of the church once it's united is to keep us all on the straight and narrow. To remind us all the time, day in and day out, that we have a responsibility in relation to one another. We have a duty in God's events to build a better world. We start at home. Some of us are extraordinarily grateful to the missionaries who came to this country to help us be what we are today. Now, let me end by returning to the oldest of religions. The religion of the current China. Scholarship tells us that what the Chinese people know today is that which was handed down to them through ages, through learning, through teaching, through education. And they zero in on the teachings of their guru, their sage, Lao Tzu, commonly known as Confucius. And if you want to understand our role today as religious communities, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, let's go to Lao Tzu. And he said to the Chinese people, in a very simple teaching, go to the people, live with them, work with them, love them, learn from them, work with what they have, start with what they know. One day they will return to you with a sense of exhilaration and excitement and say to you, now we can do it ourselves. Thank you very much. Well, that was great, wasn't it? Shall we give him another hand? Thank you once again, Jerry. Great pleasure to listen to you, and uh, we are definitely going to think about it. God bless you. Um, that brings us to the end of uh, today's, this afternoon's uh, meeting. Thank you very much for your kind patience. Thank you for everybody who participated, for the church leaders as well as uh, Professor Disho. And thank you for all of you who came. I watched how the people, as the planes flew in, uh, <laughs> came, I, I think you heard that Professor Disha is here, that's why he made sure that you were coming. Somebody said to me before the meeting started, we're only going to have about 35. I think we more or less filled the hall if I look around. Some people are even standing at the back. So thank you very much. Eric, is there anything that I need to say? Everyone is invited to come next door. Yes, there's a 
They say finger lunch, but I looked at a, a, a finger meal, but there were no fingers on it. I checked. But anyway, you're welcome to come and enjoy what we have. Please don't go away immediately. Have a chat with somebody. Those of you who uh, flew in lately, you're very welcome with all of us. And um, before we go to our rooms, let's uh, spend some time together in the room next door. Is that right, Eric? Right next door. The food is waiting. Thank you so much.